So last week we talked about how you can find a virtual or online writer's critique group in 2020 and why that's more important now than ever. But I realized after I put that video up that I was kind of putting the cart before the horse because I was telling you guys how to find a critique group and how to organize it, but we didn't really get into the critiquing itself, how to give constructive feedback to another writer and how to deal with it when you receive constructive criticism of your book for the first time. I thought about breaking this topic up into multiple videos, but all of these things are so tied together that I really think I wanna keep it all in one place. But if you came to this video looking for an answer to a specific question about giving critiques or getting critiques, then I've got timestamps in the description below. So I'm gonna split this into three parts. First, I wanna talk about what a good critique looks like. Now, at some point in a future episode, I really wanna get into the different types of editorial feedback that you're going to get on your road to publication. So covering things like the difference between developmental editing, editorial assessments, copy editing, proofreading, line edits, all of that stuff. But I do kind of need to touch on it here because a good critique, that's pretty much what it is, a good edit letter. My beta readers or my critique partners, they give me developmental edits, just like my editors do. A good critique should be a developmental edit if we're talking about a first draft, and that's typically the case. Your critique partners are probably going to be reading the first draft of your book that you are willing to put out there for anyone to read. So this isn't really about catching grammar errors or typos or like sentence level stuff. Although of course, if the writer is doing something consistently wrong, like using commas or semicolons wrong, it's totally Totally fine to point that out. But the first critique of a book should be mostly big picture. I've said this before, but no one in the history of ever has ever written a first draft where everything, world building, plot, characterization, themes, all of that stuff came out perfectly flawlessly the first time. It doesn't happen. First drafts have strengths and first drafts have weaknesses. And that's what a good critique is going to focus on, both the strengths and the weaknesses. Writing and receiving big picture notes like that is incredibly daunting for the first time. So rather than just talk about it in an abstract way, I wanted to share with you one of the editorial letters I got for one of my books. I co-authored a middle grade series called Secrets of Topsy with Kirsten Hubbard, who ironically was actually one of my very first critique partners. And as a side note, I know the reason we collaborated so well together as writers on that series was because of the years and years we had spent critiquing each other's work and getting comfortable with giving each other feedback. So on the first book in this series, we went through two rounds of pretty intense developmental edits. This is just the first letter. The second one was almost as long. But what I wanna point out here is how it's broken up into chunks. So our editors started out with a little ego stroking. She reiterated what she loved about the book and she told us what the story's strengths were. Then as we get further into it, she provided kind of a summary explanation of her notes, like a bite-sized takeaway of this is what's coming. <laughs> and she told us what her main focus for this round was going to be, which was characters, and pointed out other elements like plot that she would be saving for a later edit. So right off the bat, we knew we were in for a big edit letter. So then we got into the nitty gritty. She started with a thorough assessment of the protagonist named Davy, his emotional arc, his voice, his backstory, his important relationships, and how all of that tied into this transformation that he had by the end of the novel. She talked a lot about his relationship in particular with his dad who had passed away before the start of the book and then also with his mother who of course was with him throughout the book and kind of like their new life together and how they're adjusting as a as a family she also mentioned um one of the we did some cute little illustrations and things with formatting in this book and so she was talking about this one particular student survey that we had um, that reoccurred throughout the story and how we could use that to bring out davy's arc even more. After that, she got into the other characters. Um, this was a large cast of fifth graders in this book, and while Davy was the main character, some of the other characters do get chapters from their own points of view, and they have their own stories and their own lives going on. And so she really got into giving us assessments of all of these characters and their individual arcs, and especially those who get the POV time. Um, she also had down here, yeah, you can see there's a lot. She went through all of the characters. 
She said, um, had a note about their dialogue and making sure each character really had their own voice, their own tone that we knew which character was talking even without dialogue tags. Then after that, she wasn't done with the characters yet. She dug into their friendships and particular pairings and why their relationships were important and she had a few questions about those relationships there. Then she gave us some quote unquote minor notes about the plot. One was just about one particular character's little story. One was about a tour. This is an event that took place in the middle of the book. And then she got into what's essentially the climax of the book. And what this note is basically telling us is that we don't have a climax in this draft. The main character, Davy, did have a transformation, like his emotional arc was completed in that first draft, but there wasn't really a big external event, like something that kind of satisfyingly brought all of these characters together and felt like an, a buildup and an end in the novel. So that right there, you could see, is a really big note. Your novel doesn't have a climax. That's a problem because it's not just a matter of adding in some big scene at the end. You have to build up to whatever this climax is, right? Um, but what our editor did here is she gave us a few specific suggestions on how we can introduce some more external action to kind of like blend with the internal transformation that Davy was already going through at the end of the book. So she gave us these suggestions and we ended up actually taking one of those suggestions. It was very helpful. Um, and she finished off here with a few notes about how to improve the flow of the story, how to dig into the theme that we were going through a little bit more, and then a final tone just on the quirky tone of the books and how we might lean into that even more. At the end of this letter, she also attached a document with more comments inside the story, but even those comments weren't like line level, sentence level stuff. They were all comments on specific places within scenes where she had suggestions to help us improve all of the big picture stuff that she mentioned in her letter. So as you can probably tell from that editorial letter, Kirsten and I had to rewrite large sections of this book. And it would have been a waste of time for her to give us line edits at this point because a lot of those sentences were just going to be deleted entirely. I know it's common for authors to say, maybe jokingly, maybe not so jokingly, that they cry when they get their edit letters and that they have to eat a lot of chocolate and drink a lot of wine. But, and I really mean this, I actually really love getting letters like that. I mean, yes, I can't deny that it's really intimidating at first and I do have a feeling of, ooh, this is gonna be a lot of work. But I never have a knee-jerk reaction of, what, this book was perfect. Because what a really good edit letter does is show me that I have a really good draft and this editor wants to help me make it a really great draft. And that's what a good critique partner can do for you too. And as a critique partner, if you're in that role, that's goals. You wanna help make another author realize their book's full potential. So yes, that was a ton of work. Kirsten and I busted our butts on that edit. But that's the beautiful thing about a good critique. It doesn't make you think, oh my God, my book sucks. It makes you think, oh my God, my book is going to be amazing. So how can you give that kind of critique? The kind that's honest, that lets an author know truly just how much work needs to be done on her book, but does so in a way that doesn't crush her spirits, but instead leaves her inspired. It takes practice, but it's not as hard as you might think. First off, you wanna start with everything you loved about the book. This actually, despite what I said earlier, it's not just about stroking the author's ego. It's about telling her what her strengths are as a writer. Because, and this is especially true for anyone writing a book for the first time, we're not always actually aware of what our strengths are. When I wrote my very, very, very first book, one that was never published, I thought my strength was plot. At that time in my life, about 90% of the books I read were action thrillers. And I plotted the hell out of what I thought was a super twisty, turny, international thriller adventure. I mentioned this in last week's video, but when I finished it, I joined the Absolute Write forums and I found someone on there who said they were willing to beta read for others. She seemed nice enough, and so I contacted her and with great trepidation, sent my very first draft of my very first book off to, for someone else to read it for the first time ever. Now, I really lucked out because she really truly was 
was a very nice person and a very good critiquer, but her feedback wasn't quite what I expected. She started out by raving about my pacing, and I'll admit it, back then, I was only like 50% sure what pacing meant. She pointed out a few examples and I was like, oh, you mean there's a balance of like slow scenes and fast scenes? Well, sure, that's how Dan Brown and Dean Koontz do it. I had apparently absorbed how to write a well-paced thriller from my favorite authors without even realizing it. So this beta reader said all this nice stuff about my pacing, then pointed out several substantial plot holes in my plot of my book that I thought I had plotted so well. She was totally right. I was not nearly as good at plotting as I thought I was. But her telling me this didn't sting too bad because I was good at pacing. So you see, she didn't just make me realize I actually really needed to work on my plotting skills. She made me realize I had pacing skills. And that's important. As writers, we need to know what our true strengths are just as much as we know, need to know what our weaknesses are. So when you critique for another writer, always, always start out by telling her her strengths and her book's strengths. And I know somebody out there right now is watching and going, yeah, but what if there are no strengths? What if the book is just terrible? Listen, I have taught literally over 1,000 creative writing students of all ages, and I have never once in my entire career struggled to find multiple positive and true things to say about a story. There are always strengths. Plus, starting out by telling the author what her strengths are and what the story's strengths are is going to help you out too. Because then once you start getting into the big picture problems that exist, you can tie them back into the strengths to show her how improving these problems is going to make the story even better by bringing those strengths out. So the next step, let's talk about actually putting your critique together and how you're going to identify these big picture problems. What's gonna help you a lot, especially if you've never done this before, is to organize your critique by doing two things. One, categorize the problems from the beginning, and two, take notes as you read. When you start critiquing for the first time, create a brand new document and just start with five sections. Theme, voice, plot, character arcs, and world building. As you read, if something strikes you as off or poorly executed or confusing, make a note of it under the appropriate section in this document and add the page number. By the time you finish reading, you're going to have basically a rough draft of your critique. And it's going to be much easier to organize your thoughts because they're already partially organized into these categories. And you might not stick with these categories. I mean, you might not have any comments about theme on the first draft, or maybe this person had not a lot of issues with character but a ton of issues with plot like I did. Just like my editor did for the Secrets of Topsy editorial letter, you can make these categories whatever you need them to be to keep your thoughts organized. This rough draft of your critique is also going to give you a high level view of the novel's issues because I'm gonna go ahead and guess that you're probably not gonna read this book all in one sitting. You're gonna take a little bit of time with it, a couple days, a couple weeks, and by the time you finish reading the first draft, you might have forgotten some of the more important things near the beginning and having all of the issues written out in a separate document already is going to help you refresh your memory really quickly without having to scroll back constantly. Also, this kind of rough draft is going to help you to see connections between some of these issues and here's your final tip. Maybe figure out suggestions you can give the author on how to address these problems specifically. This is a true editorial skill. And if you're not able to do it effectively in the beginning, it's okay, it really does take a lot of practice. But I showed you earlier how my editor did this with the climax of the book. If she simply said, hey, Davy's arc about being the new kid in town, in a weird town, is great, but there isn't really a climax to the story, that would have been a kind of devastating note because it's huge. Your book has no climax is a big freaking note. But she immediately followed that with suggestions for an event that we could build to, like a festival, a field day, a celebration, and she even threw out the idea that maybe one girl shows up late because she can't find her pet hog and the kids work together to find him. And then icing on the cake, she even suggested ways we could build up to that by adding even more to the fun formatting and illustrations we'd already included. She made it really clear that these were just her suggestions and we didn't have to take any of them. And while Kirsten and I did ultimately go with one of her suggestions, I've had it happen in the past where I haven't taken an editor's suggestion, but just seeing what they thought I could do triggered ideas and I figured out a way that I could fix the issue myself. So when you go that extra step as a critique partner and you don't just say, hey, this is an issue, but you say, 
hey, this is an issue and here's a few ways you might fix it. It tells the author that things aren't as dire as they seem, that there are solutions to this problem. It says, hey, you got this and this book is gonna be so good when you're done. So like I said before, this is difficult to do at first, but you'll get better with practice and you'll be helping yourself just as much as you help your critique partner because analyzing a story in this way is only going to make you a better writer. Speaking of, let's talk about how to deal with getting criticism. Okay, the first and most important step when you receive a critique from your critique partner is this, say thank you immediately as fast as possible. As you can probably tell from what we just went through, critiquing a novel is difficult, it's time consuming, it takes up a lot of brain space, and it's just a huge favor. So when you see that email pop up in your inbox from your critique partner, before you even read their critique, reply and tell them how much you appreciate that they did this for you. Second step, don't just skim over their little introduction and get right into the notes. Pay attention to how they're delivering this to you. If they say that they're open to talking about their notes and throwing ideas around and helping you as you revise, awesome! It is always great to have a sounding board. But if it's pretty clear that they're handing you this critique and their job is done and they're stepping away, then please don't push them by trying to get them to answer for their notes or to throw ideas around with you because they've already put in the time and you're just gonna have to take their notes and do what you can with them. Okay, now let's get into how to actually deal with getting the critique itself. I said earlier that I love getting critiques and I really meant that, but I know not everybody feels that way and I'll admit that yes, I have felt stung and maybe even a little misunderstood by some edits and critiques I've received in the past. The kind where you think, mm, no, you just don't get this book. And look, sometimes that's true. There are things that are objective, but at a point it does become subjective. You might get some negative feedback that's subjective, but Okay, I try to stay really upbeat and positive in my videos because I want you to feel motivated and because I really believe that if you're the type of person who's so passionate about writing and telling stories that you seek out videos like this to watch about how to get better at it, then you can accomplish your goal of becoming an author. But I really feel like this needs to be said, even if it's a tiny bit harsh, because it's the truth. And honestly, I wish someone had said this to me 13 years ago. No one will ever be as passionate about your book as you. You are your number one fan. That is not meant to be an insult. And it definitely doesn't mean readers won't be passionate about your book because they will be. But this story came out of your head. It's literally a part of you. You should be the number one fan of your book. Why am I saying this? Because, and this is really embarrassing, but back when I wrote my very first first book and I reached out to that very first beta reader on those forums, I was super nervous, yes, but there was a small part of me who definitely thought she was going to write back and say she had found zero flaws and my book was amazing and clearly I was the next Suzanne Collins and could she please have my autograph to save for future use because obviously I was going to be a huge bestseller hit. If you've had these thoughts too, that's okay. We're human. It's okay to dream big and no judgment here. But look, one, your draft has flaws. All first drafts do. Two, you asked someone to critique your book, not compliment it. So don't be upset when they do the thing you asked them to do. Most importantly, please, don't write off a knee-jerk reaction to this critiquer explaining how they misinterpreted a scene or didn't understand a character or why that plot hole they pointed out isn't really a plot hole because of that thing that happens on the bottom of page 95 that they apparently missed. It doesn't matter if they got it wrong. Just let it go. Instead, take some time to absorb their notes. Read through the letter once or twice and then put it away, close it all down and take a few days away from it. After a few days, take it out and read it again. Maybe your knee jerk reaction was right and they misinterpreted something or they got something wrong. Fine, you don't have to take their advice, so it's okay. But maybe you're clinging to something that isn't actually working. Maybe the way it is in your head didn't translate on the page. Maybe their suggestions aren't so bad after all. Maybe your book is here and you can get it here. 
If you don't take all of your critique partner's suggestions, that's totally fine. But if you don't take any of them at all, and you go through this with a few critique partners, and it seems like nobody understands your book, it might be time to take a more honest look at your story and, frankly, your ego. Find another critique partner, not a friend who's just going to validate you, but an honest reader, and get a second opinion, and a third opinion, and a fourth opinion if necessary. Look, you owe this to yourself and your book. After all, you are your number one fan. No one on this planet will ever love your book the way you do. Learn how to embrace critical feedback and use it to make your book the best possible version of itself so that all the readers out there waiting for your characters and your story will fall in love with it too. Okay, whew. so what's next? You've got all these critiques, you've got all these notes, you kind of have a good idea of what needs to be done on your book, but how do you actually do it? That's what we're gonna be getting into in next week's episode, revising your first first draft. So if you haven't already subscribed and hit that notification bell, make sure you do so you know when that video goes up. And hey, I would love to know if you have any questions or fears about revisions. So please let me know in the comments below and I'm gonna collect them and try to address as many of them as I can in that video. Also, hey, if you found this video helpful, I would appreciate a thumbs up. That is it for this week. I hope you guys have a great week and I will see you Wednesday with another writing workshop and Friday with a fiction fix it. Bye guys.